Hi, everyone, and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Uh, I am very pleased today to welcome my guest, who is somebody we've had on once before. We were talking then about Ned and Robert and the relationship between those two people. Uh, and we've got another really interesting topic coming up today, which I'll talk about in just one moment. But uh, let's just kick off by uh, welcoming our guest. Uh, Matt, do you want to say hi? Hello, chat. It is me, Matt, also known as Joe Magician, uh, from the Joe Magician YouTube channel, the Maester Monthly podcast, Watchers on the Wall, fear, um, writer. Yes, that is what I do for them. And a Song of Ice and Fire moderator. And this is going to be a wild one, let me tell you. We're going <laughs> straight into the into the everything around Waymar Royce in the prologue. Fantastic. I'm really looking forward to it. And yeah, so so Matt Joe Magician is one of these people who's been around this community for a long time, knows the books, knows the content inside out. Uh, and that's why I love having him on here. He's got a YouTube channel. Please do go check it out. Uh, just go search for Joe Magician. Uh, I only have people on here who I would personally recommend you go and check out. And the reason why he's on for this second time is because uh, he has come up with uh, a new way of looking at uh, the first chapter, the prologue of book one, which we'll get into in just one moment. Uh, but first of all, there were a couple of super chats before we went on air that I just quickly want to say uh, thank you to people for. Uh, firstly, Maura Lee, thank you. That's an incredibly generous super chat. Um, uh, just saying, just love and appreciation for all the hard work, passion and creativity that you put into everything you do uh, for both of your channels. Thank you, Maura. I really appreciate that. Uh, and Jack Hurst saying, we'll have to catch up tomorrow, but wanted to donate and say thanks for all the hard work. You make our long nights between the books and seasons bearable. Uh, Jack, thank you for that as well. That's very kind. And I did see you dropped a question down on Patreon. We'll come and pick up on that uh, in a little bit. Uh, so, guys, as always, what we'll do is I've got some questions from my patrons, which we will come to in a moment. And if there's any super chats, we'll definitely pick up on them as we go through. Uh, but first of all, I wanted to just uh, get into the meat of this idea first. Now, every now and then within the community, an idea comes along that a lot of people are talking about. And there are no real new ideas here in this community. So that one of the things that I've decided is that everybody builds on everyone else. But you sometimes find that things spark off debate and looking at things in a new way. And certainly over the last two, three, four months, there's been a lot of conversation about the subject of the prologue. And a lot of that seems to have been sparked off by uh, my guest's video, uh, which was looking at the prologue in a new way, specifically in relation to Waymar Royce. Now, I'll ask uh, uh, Matt in a moment for you to just sort of quickly set out what you said in that video before we get into it. But just to remind people what we're talking about here, we're talking about, um, you'll remember it's scene one of the show, it's also the prologue in the book, so it's the very first thing we come across and we get these three uh, members of the Night Watch who are off ranging north of the wall and they encounter, uh, first of all, some dead bodies that disappear and then the others. And uh, this is, uh, at one level uh, already we can see that there's a clear uh, thing that's going on here. Uh, literarily, it's to show us right from the off, this is a high fantasy story. There are uh, people rising, raising, being raised from the dead. There are supernatural creatures. There's all these kind of things going on because straight away after this, we go clunking back into what appears to be this very low fantasy world where all the characters were shown to be wise, Maester Lewin, Tyrion, they all scoff at the idea of the others. Uh, and But this is to show us that actually there's something else going on there. So that's one thing that we've got that everybody accepts is there in the prologue. But clearly there are more layers to this. Now, Matt, do you want to just sort of kick us off just by saying when you did your read through again, what was it that you saw afresh that, that sort of sparked all this? This is actually um, a funny story and something Aziz from History of Westeros has given me grief about. I did not get this from a reread. Uh, it was <laughs> me and my uh, my cousin, Mr. Woodhouse. Uh, we were up at his cabin up in Maine and we were talking about A Song of Ice and Fire and just kind of out of nowhere, we were like, why did they kill Waymar Royce? Like. They, they killed one, they let the other one go, but they did something different for Waymar. Like, why did they do this? And that's the basic simple part of the idea. What we see from the others and how they treat Waymar is 
completely off character from everything else we see from them for the rest of the books. We basically only see, I think, one other for the entire rest of the book so far, and that's the one that Sam kills. Every other time they show up, it's always by proxy. They send their puppets. They send winter and mists to do their dirty work for him. But for Waymar, they show up in force showing themselves off. And after you sort of go through the reasons they could have killed him, like maybe they knew he was a commander because he was like dressed well or something like that. Well, they're, they're, not, they're not really targeting commanders until much later. If this is the first time, then... I guess it makes sense, but they should they should know by observing him that he's not really that great of commander. If he is one, if you wanted to kill someone, you would probably kill Way, uh, Will or Garrett. And then you work through the rest of them. And finally, you get back to the idea that, and this was something that we noticed just because of the position of the two chapters. Um, the description of Waymar Royce is almost mirrored for Jon Snow in the very next chapter. They're both described with a similar build. They both have similar hair colors. They both have similar eyes. They both have gray eyes. Gray eyes are very rare in A Song of Ice and Fire. They're both rangers. They're both first men rangers from ancient huge families. And so the theory itself is breaking down and going into why the others killed Waymar. And my supposition is they killed him because they thought he was John. Okay. So that. And and I like this theory, by the way, guys. Just sort of to cut the chase, um, but but that's the theory. Now uh, I've got one question uh, from one of my patrons here, which I think immediately jumps off from that. Lady Elaine Fairchild um, says, uh, "If this theory is right about the others believing that Waymar is John, what were their intentions for John? Why are they searching for John?" Ah, well, this is a uh, an important part of the others that has uh, been confirmed in the show, not so much in the books, though the hints are there. It's that the the others are powered by the magic of the children. And we know the children are famous for their green dreams. They're famous for being able to see across time and space. So if you have some superpowered humans who control ice and draw their power in some way from the same source as the children, why wouldn't they have the same gifts? Maybe it seems likely they do. And in the show, it actually goes further that the Night King can see and touch Bran even through a vision, making the connection even stronger. So why did they want John? Probably for the same reason that Melisandre was trying to find Stannis. The same reason that so many people chase prophecy and visions, the Targaryens as well, when, when they try to chase the um, prince that was promised. It seems to be this whole monomyth idea that everyone's looking for someone special and the others have decided it's John. Okay. So, so as I say, I like, I like this idea and I like the idea that they are searching for this figure that they've heard of or the, the leader of the humans or the prophecy or whatever it is. Um, the one sort of, um, thing that I would query on this is is the extent of the evidence that that this was a deliberate targeting mm -hmm. of Waymar um, in that uh, yes you could interpret it as they they came up and they 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 would chose him because it was him but similarly it could be that they were testing a particular one of the others that had to kill a human one-on-one -on -one to prove their worth or something along those lines. It could be, I, I think you, if you interpret it from the other way around, you, you, there are other ways of interpreting sure. that evidence. Um, I would say the, the thing that personally convinced me that it wasn't just a, something of the other culture we don't understand or some kind of, uh, some people have suggested that they were doing it for fun, basically, because they do laugh at Waymar, but that's only after Waymar uh, fails some important tests. Like, he doesn't have Valyrian steel, he's not a great swordsman, he actually bleeds, which the bleeding thing is something else. But I think the greatest evidence is what happens with John as he goes forward. For instance, the first time the others attack after this in force is at the fist of the first men where john was supposed to be because and craster this is the other important part of it craster at a glance sees john so and says you look like a stark and we know that craster is involved with the others in a deep way 
So when you when you put all these things together, they attack the fist that Corn Half Hand just out of nowhere took John away from, and they attack with huge amount of people, and then they send out scouts afterwards to track down the stragglers, which we don't see them do again. And then just the absurd amount of interest that Craster gives John, and then also Waymar. If you go back and read the chapter itself, he pays way more attention to Waymar than any than either of the other two, than either of the other two, and he actually knows them. They're his friends, one of well, at least Garrett is. So you put these all together, and not only is Craster and the others paying attention to John, they're paying a huge amounts of attention to Waymar. So both of them are filling some sort of criteria that they're both tuned into in some way, which I think just speaks to it may not be John Snow in particular, but both of them fill some archetype. Yeah, I, I think I I agree and I agree with that. And I think uh, we were talking very briefly before we went on air about uh, a few other people who've been talking about this. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Gray Area who was saying that perhaps it's a stock that they were looking for. Yeah. And that that for me, I think that that certainly does resonate. The things that you've said when you know the description of uh, of Weimar does sound quite starkish, uh, and John looks starkish. And so that kind of um, uh, that that resonates for me, and I think that I definitely subscribe to the idea that the Starks on the show, as we've seen, um, uh, there is a clear um, uh, equals and opposites, not perhaps not equals, but opposites about mm -hmm. Bran and the Night King, and I think that this shows that there's this mirroring of the the White Walkers and the Starks in a way. So I think that there's. The, the fact that the Starks are there and have always been there is this kind of apparent first line of defense against the others that clearly shows and makes sense that the others would be looking out for Starks all these years later if they're going to be doing, uh, launching some sort of attack. Um, one other thing is perhaps a slightly more uh, thematic level here when we're talking about the prologue. Uh, as I was, I was wondering whether you th there was anything that uh, struck you in terms of the language usage because when I was rereading it just in preparation for this, the thing which struck me were the the amount of uh, words that George R. R. Martin uses there that later on they 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 used in a way that makes it go bing 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 bing. You mean something mm -hmm. when you're saying that, and in particular the juxtaposition of two things. So the the couple of things that struck me, I wonder if there's anything that struck you were. Uh, cold and heat or ice and mm -hmm. fire are used almost interchangeably a, a lot of the time when uh, I think it was Garrett describes how when he was feeling really cold and it's, he, he describes it as it, as it was burning mm -hmm. and he talked about is like being uh, stuff being on fire uh, and so that's that's very much the hot cold kind of thing and the second thing was uh, which I which really struck me I hadn't noticed before was when you get Will who's watching he's our witness to all of this and he's watching from the top of a tree mm -hmm. what's going on and the thing which is mentioned is the tree sap he feels the tree sap against him which obviously is a huge thing because that is like the lifeblood of a tree and also immediately makes us think about the weirwoods where the sap is incredibly important. But are there any other sort of little bits of language usage there that George R. R. Martin used that particularly has struck you? Um, there or are. I, I especially like the the uh, the will in the tree part. Uh, LML did a theory uh, as a takeoff on mine after we did our live stream where he got very, very excited and then wrote his own, which... You should go watch it's it's a you should i think it's called starting back or something like that one of the mods will drop the link in it it's a good one you should watch it but when you look at the archetypes of the two characters in particular that are actually present you have waymar who is a mirror of john and you have will up a tree who's a scout and that seems like bran watching as his brother has to duel the others and that's that's an idea i'm going to develop in the future about what the end game will be like and what that scene actually means. Cause there was a, there was a mess. There was a line in the upcoming promo where um, for this upcoming season where HBO said that this prologue will come back somehow in this final season. And it actually has come back already in particular that um, 
when John dueled the other in hard home, if you if you take away John's Valyrian and Steel Sword, it's Waymar's fight. It's the exact same one. The way they fight, the way the other is winning, the way John is getting his ass kicked until Long Claw changes the math. And that's mm. sort of the difference between the two of them. But as to your uh, question, I always liked that Waymar and John are both described as slender as a knife, sort of okay. a light yeah. bringer, a weapon, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, and I think, yeah, again, that sort of ties in with the idea that they're, they're both the same and that it's quite a starkish look. One mm -hmm. other thing before moving on, which uh, I just remembered actually, was um, one of them, either Will or Garrett, talks about the, uh, the, the, the dead uh, sing no songs. Uh, yeah. which immediately ties in with like the idea of a song of ice and fire. And then it's kind of picked up by um, um, uh, Waymar himself when his uh, rather cool way of saying, come on then, let's fight, is 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 in effectively inviting <laughs> somebody for a dance. Oh, um, that's true. That's uh, and, uh, dance with me, yeah. So, it, so it's like, uh, again, we get this kind of musical idea that, that's sort of flowing through there. So um, there, there's lots of good themes going through. Um, uh, Benny Schofield uh, uh, or uh, Sconfield or Sconfeld, I should Sconfeld. say. Sconfeld. Uh, or <laughs> Schoenfeld. I'll stop trying to pronounce the name now. Uh, if the others were looking for a Stark, why didn't they pay such attention to Benjen? That's a good question. Do you have an answer to that one? They did pay attention to Benjen. They probably <laughs> killed him. They did to him what they did to Waymar. Something about John and Benjen, I mean, uh, Waymar and Benjen was wrong, where something about John is right. I, th I have ideas about what the differences is. I don't know them for certain. Uh, I've been reading the chats on people who have been like, there's a lot, this is a lot of circumstantial stuff. And it is because it's such a, it's such a large idea and it, it touches so many different parts. But if it's true, it's not really the kind of thing that George is really going to explicitly say until the end because it would reveal too much about the others in a way. Yeah, so we need, in the books, Benjen's still a big mystery, to be mm -hmm. honest, so uh, so we don't know. But certainly on the show, it very much appears that, yes, the White Walkers did attack him, uh, and he kind of survived, and the children were responsible for keeping him alive. So uh, you get this idea again of like the children and the White Walkers perhaps acting against each other, but having access to quite similar magic in a way yes. um, because they're bringing him back in this kind of half life or half death way that means that he can't cross the wall. So um, uh, I, yeah, I, I would agree completely. The answer is that they did pay attention, but they did not finish him off. I think that was just uh, um, them not doing a proper job rather than anything else, um, rather than I, just I have, I have him a... and then giving up. I have an extra point about this that I that I really love, and um, it's something that wasn't in the original essay because I I published this about four or five years ago on Reddit. It won um, uh, best new post of the year, something like that. The video is a redo of that, and in this I pointed out something that when Melisandre asks for visions of Azor High, all she sees is snow. Capital S, mm -hmm. she's Jon Snow, but Melisandre knows Jon. She knows who he is. She's met him. What if? You, you view this from the other side. What if the others are asking for visions of Zora High and they just see this face of a Stark? Like something that's uncertain, something that a person they don't know. It would make sense that they keep guessing and kind of getting it wrong a little bit because uh, John also has a very Starkish face, which means his face is common to their family. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, I, I, I agree. And I think I certainly like the idea that the others have got this they've certainly got magic that mm -hmm. is a sort of an echo of the um uh, what I, I i tend to call the old magic the the, the whole the, the green seer magic is a sort of a, a dark version of that in some kind of way and that seems to imply that they would be able to see visions they might be able to see the past they might even be able to see the future and things like this so it's entirely possible that they will have seen something and it may well indeed, and I don't think this is the, the live stream to get into this, but <laughs> it may well be that the, something they saw was what prompted them to start yes. moving. Um, 
Uh, but this, because we were talking about Benjen, we did have a, a super chat a moment ago from Christy Miller uh, saying, uh, did Benjen already know about the others prior to coming to the feast at Winterfell, either in the book or the show? Um, uh, do you have a quick answer to that one? Um, I think he does, doesn't he? I, I think he says something at Winterfell where there's something, I can't remember the exact line, but I remember getting the impression that he's, he knows more than he's saying, especially when he talks to John. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's certainly the the impression we get I, in both the books and the show is that the, the others, the White Walkers, have been moving for a while, not in a huge way, destroying fast swathes of things, but mm -hmm. they've been moving. They saw a few of them were seen off at, at East Watch at some point. They're, they're, the the wildlings have got stories of them moving. So I think that there's there's rumours. Certainly by the time John gets up to the wall, back with Benjamin, then uh, Gerald Mormont is already talking about it with a, an air of seriousness, not just as a fairy oh. tale kind of way. I forgot the so, other thing, Craster. They know Craster's yeah. been giving over his kids, so they, well, they watch those. They, they do, but they but whether they actually believe he's been handing them over to the others or whether that's just uh, he leaves his yeah, kids out I there. That's, for, true, but, yeah. uh, I, that's never made entirely clear. I don't think that they the, the, the rangers within the Night's Watch necessarily thought the others were there and were moving and were doing things. I think that they just thought this was just a... He was, handing his his children over to the night and you know wolves took them or whatever um but craster probably believed he had a a pact um <laughs> incidentally i saw lml in the chat a moment ago hi lml um both uh matt jay magician and i will be on uh, lml's channel at some point i've entirely forgotten the date but quite soon sunday uh, is it on sunday um sunday, so, Eastern time on uh between two weirwoods on between two weirwoods and the subject there is one that uh i think is gonna be a fascinating one um it, we're going to be talking about sources of magic and just mm. how the mechanisms of magic how does it actually work so uh if, you, if you're at all interested in that uh and i think i think crowfood's daughter's on there as well which would be fantastic be. so uh um i'm feeling humble to be amongst such huge brains so i'm very much looking forward to that um and also Secret of Citadel in the chat. Hello there, Gemma. Good to see you. Up, uh, Gemma? Uh, uh, so um, uh, let's just get on to a few. Uh, we've got one more question, I think, about the the prologue for you, mm -hmm. which is from Bonds, another one of my uh, patrons, asking about, so this starts about asking how many White Walkers there were. So mm. way, as Waymar fought them and then they appeared three, four, five, um, but then Waymar's cloak, when Will looks at it, had a dozen slashes. Now, is this, and I think I'll, I'll have a first bash at this one, but is this uh, saying that there were 12 of the others, uh, or is this something slightly more thematic? Personally, I think that it's more thematic. I think that the impression we got was that the others were just like stabbing down like that. And a dozen was just like a round figure of however many there were. Um, the 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 link that is possibly there that I think you're uh, Bonds you were sort of alluding to was this idea of Azora High and his twelve companions. Huh. So do you think that there's anything there that's perhaps uh, a sort of a thematic link, or or is it just a random bit of wordplay? Hmm. Um, just off the cuff, I would assume there are more there are more um, cuts in the in his cloak because their swords probably went through him to the other side, like in a, in one side, out the other, you get two stab wounds that way. It says they come up and they kill him at once. It kind of looks, it kind of sounds like they shoved their swords all the way through him. So it doesn't yeah. have to. And also the, the other he was fighting also carved him up pretty good. So it, that doesn't seem particularly hard to explain, but I hadn't thought about the, the numerology part. That's something LML is very tuned into. Uh, he yes in the chat last hero math, um, I think that and and he follows it up by saying a dozen wounds in the body plus the one eye wound. So the yeah, idea I, it, here is that and and I'm sure at some if Odin so if Odin were here he'd be talking a lot about LML. If LML <laughs> were here he'd be talking a lot about Odin. Odin talking uh, about LML. Mm. <laughs> uh, so 
uh, what uh, I, I think this is probably deliberate, but it could yeah. just be just a bit of loose language to be a, a sort of an echo of a story that we're going to hear a little bit later from Old Man. Um, but I don't think it means that they are the Azor Ahai and his 12 companions uh, just as the others. I don't think that's that's what's going on there. No, I don't think that either. I think if there's a number that there should be the number of others, it should be 79 Yeah. for the seconds. Uh, okay, let's move on. Guys, if you've got more questions about the prologue, because there's a lot going on there in the prologue, uh, please do drop them down there in the chat. Um, I've got a lot of other questions from my patrons that are picking up on other kind of related issues with the others and the children. So we're going to start piling into them. Uh, if you've got questions about them, please do drop them in as well. But don't, if you've got things about the prologue as we have Matt here, please do uh, drop them in there. So um, uh, one other thing, actually, I've got one more, I think, about the the prologue here before we All move right. on. Susan, yeah, Susan Dunkel from, uh, from my... Uh, Patreon uh, group saying Brand's description of the deserter Garrett is very interesting, um, as well as the fact that Garrett's red eyes are what um, Brand thinks about later. His reaction to seeing the White Walkers is much stronger than Royce, Will, Sam, or the other Black Brothers. None of them babbled incoherently or deserted without a plan. Uh, hmm. It seems strange that such a hardened man, 40 years on the wall, etc., would lose his wits completely. Is it possible that he was wild, or have I read this prologue too many times? Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll kick off there. Matt, you may have some deeper thoughts on this, but my initial reaction is, is that the fact that he was on the wall for 40 years seems to suggest that perhaps he's more in tune with what might have been out there. He, From quite early on in the prologue, he seems unnerved. He thought it was unnaturally quiet. It was too cold. Uh, he didn't like it. He wanted to go back. Uh, and there's no hint that he's a scared person. He just knew something was wrong. And I think that the fact that he reacted as he did was because he had, it was building up for him for quite a while. Whereas Waymar Royce was completely oblivious to anything being possibly wrong at all until suddenly something com comes right at him and he has to respond. So that would be my uh, take on that. Have you got anything to add to that one? Um, it's always puzzled me how he got away, why they didn't care, especially when they had just a bunch of whites. They raised up Waymar right afterwards. Will was there, they could have raised him too. Why did they let him go away? Um, it I, I think it's possible maybe they sent whites to chase him and they just didn't catch him. They kept like almost getting there to keep him terrified as he got back to the wall. That would, because he seems to be a messenger from the north. They're trying to tell the south they're back. And well, that's my interpretation of that. And especially because I think there's a line where that Garrett's described as like a man dead on his feet that he's already like dead inside. Ned Stark talks about that. So he could be a symbolic white sent back from across the wall as a warning for whatever is about to happen. Because it it is, especially in the show, they're described as sort of like Terminators, but they've really been cooling their heels for like five, 10,000 years. They've been abiding by whatever's going on. Something has changed recently. And Garrett being a person that's supposed to deliver a message that John, I mean, that Ned did not listen to seems to be one of the primary reasons we have this entire series. Yeah, I agree. And I think that having thought a couple of times about this idea of how did he get back, I think I think there are two options, and I think either is possible. Option number one is that they did just let him go mm -hmm. uh, for the reasons that you've set out, that he was a warning, that they were actually... A, they, they decided, you know what, we don't care anymore whether people know we're coming. We want them to know we're coming. Uh, that is option number one. Option number two is that um, you see he was the person all the way through the prologue who uh, actually has the right idea. He mm. says, let's go back. He then says, let's have a fire. Uh, and all of these things were overruled. And then... Uh, the, the other two head off and those are the two who die and he's there and the, so option number two is that he simply was good at his job and he managed to escape True. which is possible he could yeah, have exactly he could have thought you know what actually I know something's gone wrong here I can hear somebody screaming I'm getting out of here he could have 
lit a fire and the others decided it's actually not worth it. We've come for what we wanted uh, and then left him. It's th that, that it could just be that he was competent and did what he had to do and then got out of there. So those are my, those are the two options. I think either hold up and either work. And I don't think as far as I'm concerned, it actually makes a huge difference to the plot, which of those true is true. I think it, it adds a certain something to uh, the character of the others if they did indeed just see him and say, you know what, go tell them we don't care. I think that says something about them a little bit more, but I think either of those two solutions uh, actually work. Um, what uh, about the cold? We talked about a little bit about the cold earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, Torsten D's talking about this, connect, this sort of relationship between the others and the cold and the winter. Uh, and he's saying, I'm still wondering if the others bring the winter or the other way around. They definitely bring the cold. I think we can definitely agree on that. When they arrive, for whatever reason, cold comes with them. Uh, that's in the show and in the books. But there have been long and harsh winters during the time that they were inactive. So uh, the, the the summary question there is why are the seasons irregular, which I think is a slightly oh. different question. Mm -hmm. But moving, just taking this first bit directly about the others, do they bring the winter, as in do they bring the climate change, or do they just bring the weather? That is, that is a tough one. Uh, I have actually, I don't know if you've seen these two, the videos where like astrophysicists and climatologists try and figure out like how this could actually work. <laughs> Some people have suggested um, they're called, um, I forget the exact word, but they're variable stars where they contract and get smaller at mm. random intervals, which would create something like this. But in terms of what George is thinking, I think it's clear just from the way the far north behaves that it is always in winter suggests that it is them causing it uh, especially because um from the show i'm sorry but to the chat by the way i'm referencing the show a lot that's um uh, i know that's you're, you're allowed to reference the show this is yeah. fine <laughs> um we see the original site where the others were created with the with the night king character in the show it used to be green it used to be it used to look like the riverlands and now it is a frozen hellscape all the way down to the wall and the north, which means the north used to be much warmer. If they're not the ones causing that, then it's it's hard to understand what's going on. Like, there's no geological or like physical reason otherwise. I, I think it just has to be them. We just don't understand the mechanism. Yeah. So I think in terms of they definitely bring the weather. Mm -hmm. I think that they have a magical way, for me, they have a magical way of bringing some sort of climate change. They bring the winter. That's that's how I interpret it. I think that that is different to the the, the changing of the seasons in, in on planet or more generally. I think that that's a slightly separate thing. In terms of the others, I think that as they come south and as more of the world is in their realm as it were as it were then that area has winter so i think it's a combination of the two um in terms of the why are the seasons changeable uh, yeah i've seen a couple of the videos you're talking about about uh, about this i th i think there are some wacky and crazy ideas um I, my own one is i like the idea that perhaps it's a planet which is like on some kind of a weird orbit which isn't like circular but sort of like moves around and mm -hmm. that's just my own uh completely tinfoil speculation and there's no basis for it and i think actually that's how george wants it whenever i, I, I try not to come back to this too many times uh as an answer but i think it is valid this time George's answer a lot of the time when people ask him questions like this is, it's a magic world. Yeah. And I think that we have to accept the fact that if we're looking for a scientific answer to something, that's not how George was thinking when he was creating this. He was thinking oh. in terms of magic. And as a result, it's the seasons have been put out of whack thematically. I'm going off on a little rant here, apologies. But thematically, I think that shows that not all is right with nature with the world because things are out of whack things aren't as they ought to be and i think that that is trying to show us something but the the answer 
to the question about why the seasons are irregular is that it, we there is not a uh, a scientific answer to it it's a magical uh, hmm. question i would actually look uh, more towards a literary interpretation more than a scientific one and i think it's very similar to the lord of the rings where sauron uses mount doom to create essentially clouds of ash to go forward so his orcs can stay in the um stay in the shade because for some reason they don't like sunlight the same for the nazgul i imagine it's something similar to that but george decided instead of a volcano it would be an endless storm emanating from the north that kind of thing yeah yeah i i agree um and, and you just brought with when you're talking lord of the rings you just brought to mind <laughs> the, the idea of of saruman there when he's sending the weather uh, yes. out to, to to go uh, effectively attack the uh, the fellowship and that is sort of the idea. It's magical weather that's going uh, going on there. I had a super chat from Bridget Walsh saying five hundred people. Wow! Congrats. So yeah, this is uh, this is great. Uh, uh, five hundred and thirteen at the moment, according to me. So uh, thank you so much for uh, for watching. I'm really enjoying this chat, and uh, it's fantastic having Matt on here as well. And and thank you. I've been keeping an eye on the chat, and there's uh, some fantastic questions and thoughts going on in there. So we'll definitely dip into there. And uh, Matt, whenever I go off in a little rant, do please have a quick check in, see if there's uh, uh, any. Uh, good questions or comments in the chat for us to be uh, to be picking up on in this. Um, I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to try and branch out a little bit now to talk about the uh, the children of the forest and the others more broadly, not just about the, the prologue. Uh, with a couple of questions from my patrons. The first one from Animal Lover Nicole asking, "How many families have interbred with children, children of the forest, and giants?" And what uh, can we still see from that? Well, the, I mean, I'll, I'll have a b first bash at this, and then, then Matt, you can give us the real answer, the exact number, please. <laughs> uh, so, the, so the short answer is we do not know. Uh, uh, so we don't know how many over time. There are hints, and no more is the is where we're at. So there are some hints, obviously, in terms of the children of the forest, there are hints that I think are probably true that somewhere in the past, House Reed, uh, the Cranog men did uh, intermarry uh, with the uh, the children of the forest. Uh, that's shown uh, not just in House Reed's uh, very clear green seer powers, but also their physique seems a lot different to normal human pure human if we're pure human if you like <laughs> uh and then uh in terms of the giants then again we have rumors of um i think on skagos there are rumors uh, of that they are descended from giants um house umba there are sort of obviously their sigil is of a giant in chains and they're all described as being quite large so there are hints of that. And north of the wall, there are lots more hints as well. Uh, so the short answer is we don't know. Um, but uh, in terms of what can we still see from that, I think there are some hints in the different some of the different families. For me, the question is, what does that mean, if anything, for the plot or the story? Have you got anything to add on to that? Or are there any other examples you can think of that I might have missed? I would say the um, the closest story that we've heard of any sort of like actual interbreeding between children and humans would probably be the um, the Ward King and his followers, where um, from the Wolf's Wood that fought against the Starks, the Starks killed most of the men and then took all the women as their wives, which as a story is sort of an origin story for how the Starks probably got their connection to the children in some way. Like it only takes one, especially with with Westeros, how everyone interbreeds. It only takes one house to do it. Then it just sort of trickles down. That's the story of Garth Greenhand, basically. Um, but th there's hints of very close relationships, certainly House Gardner and their their Green Hand and the Order of the Green Hand from um, Isle of Faces. Sorry, I had to look at my map while I was doing that. Green Men. I, I, forgot, the, I forgot the name of them. Um, you know, there's, also, there's, yeah. Yeah, there's all sorts of hints that the that humans have gotten gifts from the children whether that's interbreeding whether it's third eye opening or just magic magic's probably the easiest explanation but i would say the ward king and his followers who are almost certainly by the way house blackwood 
that that's probably their origin, but that would be the closest one I can think of. Yeah, I, I'd agree. And is there anything in terms of the the plot? So I think the, the for me the the biggest plot uh, link here is the house read thing um, mm -hmm. that uh, they are very in tune with nature and the old magic and the weirwood network and i think that is one of the big driving forces of the whole plot that we've got so that incidentally in my uh almost never-ending series of videos on um the robert's rebellion tower of joy i will do one on how Halland reed and blood raven masterminded the whole thing um uh, a bit later on down the line so that's uh, that's something to look forward to but is there anything else in terms of that in, how you think that this might actually impact on the plot this idea that there was sort of um in, intermarriage or, or or whatever mixed heritages in the past hmm. um well one thing for certain we read from fire and blood that there are secret first men houses still lurking around the south so as we get to the end game of M game of thrones that will certainly probably come up as we're drawing battle lines and factioning because in the past they've tended to gone that way like the the followers of Rhaenyra quite a few of them were first men houses who on I, I was actually questioning what this was about why they did that and I asked Aziz and Aziz gave me a very practical answer because first men keep their word mm. so if we're talking about promises and who will be loyal to which side as we're going forward as the long night falls that could be predictive and there also seems to be this idea that the one that the houses that reached for this power and grabbed it used to be the underdogs that they turned to the children as sort of a way to leapfrog the people that are currently in charge that it, that's the story of the knight's king story of the gray king I mean, there's lots of myths about that about the magical younger sibling that grabbed magic as a way to usurp the older sibling yeah um i think just as a last thing just to uh, pick up on that before we move on um in terms of the first men families families that still worship the old gods you mentioned that that said it was said in uh, fire and blood i think mm -hmm. that's queen alistaine was was mentioning yes. that um uh, clearly there's places like house blackwood there is if you look on a map of um uh, westeros there's a sort of an arc you can actually sort of see of where the weirwoods are or where the old magic seems to remain which you can sort of draw from the neck with house reed all the way around there's places like old stones and then uh, raven tree hall um uh, and then heading up i'm sure i'm missing out one uh, where beric dondarrion was uh, high heart um, heard, yep. And then leading down to the Isle of Faces, so there's a sort of an arc of what were apparently holy places or places that have still got the old magic in them there. And as a complete aside, but because my Traveller's Guide series uh, has reached dawn, I was reminded when I was researching that the houses to the west of dawn, um, places like House Dane as well as House Fowler and places like that, they although they're not pure first man blood they are still mostly first man uh because the uh the both the andals and the ruinar didn't really reach that far in their uh, sort of invasions and so that this is why the coloring uh the the, the, the stereotypical look of the people the uh, the stony dornish is actually very different from the salty dornish because they've still got a huge amount of first man blood in them so that's just a, a little aside there but there is a lot there that we don't know about and also uh another thing from fire and blood after the dance of the dragons uh ten thousand northmen uh yeah. set up home in the riverlands uh, so, and and married uh the the uh, the widows of um uh, women, uh, so w w the widows of people who died in the in the wars. Uh, so uh, there's a huge amount of first men blood just dotted around all over the place. But I think we've digressed enough on that one for now. <laughs> um, 
Uh, let's take one more question from, I, I haven't spotted any more super chats, uh, but I did spot uh, one thing just in the chat that I just wanted to very quick. Somebody, apologies, I didn't catch the name, um, uh, asked whether we would see Howland Reed in season eight. Fingers crossed. I really, really hope so. We will definitely see him in, uh, in the last two books, I think probably in A Dream of Spring rather than The Winds of Winter. Um, I think on the show... I suspect they've got this far without relying on him, without name-checking him much at all. I think that if he does appear, it's not going to be as a major character doing the things that he will do in the book. In the books, I'm pretty sure he's going to be the person who's going to be central to tying together a lot of the pieces uh, of, of the backstory that Bran and Sam have been doing on the show. So he's not going to be doing that, but he may... In the same way that they sort of showed us a few, uh, some things like the Horn of Winter and the Sword Dawn uh, just lingered on it. The camera lingered on them for a few seconds and then moved on. It wouldn't surprise me if they show us Howland Reed, but he doesn't have much of a role. Um, do, you, do you disagree? Do you think he's going to come in and save the day? Um, well... That was kind of his thing at the Tower of Joy. At the last second, he made sure the Starks won over the... Uh, LML loves this one. Over the white swords that are very much other-like. So it, it could just be a read. It could be him. It's If you ask um, certain people like, uh, like <laughs> Chloe, Queen of Love and Beauty, I am sure she will howl at the moon that... Howland Reed is going to make a huge difference going forward. And you know what? He just might, because I think he's one of the few people that might actually convince other people that John is truly a Targaryen. Because what we've seen from the show, from the proof that's been given, is a vision from Bran. Not many people are believing Bran right now. And they probably wouldn't, even if he told them they call him crazy. They call him Mad Bran, the Mad King of the North, basically. And Sam, who even when he has great evidence, very few people even believe him, especially at the Citadel. Like that's that was part of his arc. He ran away in order to deliver the news that nobody else would believe. So a, a high yeah, Lord like Howland Reed Voucher. Um, oh yeah, in the books, yeah. yeah. Um, even then, Sam has trouble getting people to believe him. Like, um, so okay. a, a high Lord's word would make a big difference. I mean, I think that's fair enough. I I. I hope he does. I love Helen Reed. He's one of my favorite characters in the books, I have to say, mm -hmm. uh, even though we've never met him. Uh, no. I, I, I love him from afar. Um, but uh, on the show, the only way is through Mira. Uh, she did name check him just very briefly when they came from north of the wall and asked to be let through. She had, she called herself uh, the daughter of Howland Reed. So we actually got a name check of him. And then obviously she said she was going back home. So if we see her again, then I think there's a chance that she might either return with her father or we might see her with her father. Uh, but I don't think he's going to have as big a role as you clearly do. Um, <laughs> another question from my uh, patrons, yeah. uh, Jack Hurst, who did the super chat earlier without the question, but, but Jack, here, here is the question he asked over on Patreon. Um, in the cast interviews, so this is uh, building on the show, but I think it's uh, there, there's clearly a book link here too. In the cast interviews where each main actor gave us commentary through their character's journey so far, Isaac Hempstead Wright, who is Bran, described the moment the Night King killed the Three-Eyed Raven as a showdown between ancient enemies. Huh. What do you think this means? Do you think that this implies that multiple Three-Eyed Ravens have been working against the Night King for thousands of years? I mean, for book people, I think we can expand this out to has the Three-Eyed Crow or the Green Seer uh, in, that, um, uh, in that cave been working against the others all this time? What do you think? Is this a long-term battle that's been going on? Um, yes. I... W I hmm... There is the idea that the the three-eyed crow is particularly blood raven as like the actual person but the role of somebody who's in charge of the weirwoods has probably been around as long as the others and the children have been clashing um it also appears that the way that they were created and the way that the children seem to have 
like a get out of jail free card with their obsidian daggers they somehow built into their creations that they at least knew there was a chance that they might have to kill their own creations at some point. And from the books we see in front of Blood Raven on his cave, there's just endless amounts of skulls and dead bodies. And, and actually in the walls, there's these weird little alcoves where they have different skulls in there with weird roots going through it, suggesting that maybe those were previous ones. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that it's, it, to me, it seems reasonably clear that that as a base has been used for a long time. And uh, they have had people who have been hooked up to the Weirwood net, mm. whether they were called the Three-Eyed Crow or you know, something in the language of the children of the, uh, uh, the children of the forest, uh, who knows? I think the actual, uh, the nomenc nomenclature here is less important <laughs> than the, the yeah. actually what was happening. Um, and in, I agree completely about the idea that they thought that they might at some point have to destroy their creations, the others. And I think that we see this, it's, it's very clear when you look at on the show um, that the, the White Walkers, their strengths are everything against humans. So they're stronger than humans. They, uh, they appear invulnerable against the kinds of weapons that humans use. Um, uh, when a human dies, it can be raised back to life again uh, to fight on the White Walker's side and so on. They seem to be an anti-human machine, mm -hmm. but they are vulnerable to the kinds of things that the children of the forest use. So, for example, dragon glass was what the children of the forest used all the time as their weapons, and the White Walkers were vulnerable to dragon glass. And so that's the kind of thing... If you were concerned, you might at some point have to face them yourself, that you would kind of build into the design, as it were. Um, and also, the we'll come on to it in a later question, actually, the, the running water issue, the, the ability of, of them or not to be able to cross running water. Um, B1 Mary, thank you so much. That's a very generous $25, very kind as a, a super chat saying, just because I love you both thank you. Uh, and have missed the last few sessions with both Robert and Matt's live chats. Well, it's great to have you back. Uh, and thank you so much. That's incredibly generous. Um, let's uh, go to, I can't see, I haven't spotted whether they are in the chat or not, uh, but Baal the Bard, uh, who is uh, a regular oh, in these Gretchen. parts. I haven't seen um, laid forth the idea that the others are a sort of weapon that was made for protection, uh, as we have been talking about, but is getting used by someone who is now an aggressor. Uh, so using the Kingsguard as a parallel, Visenya made them to protect her king, but through the centuries we've seen them used for aggression by bad kings like Aerys and Joffrey. Um, if so, who is wielding this weapon now? who is you to hunt down Starks or whatever. Do you think that they are, so I think the question is, do you think they are being used by anyone as a weapon anymore? They were clearly were created to be a weapon against humans. Do you think that they're now being used as a weapon by somebody else? Hmm. That's where, that's basically a question is, is there a great other basically? Is there a yes. Night King and a great other behind it? Um, I tend to say no, because a lot of the lead up, like I mentioned this earlier when we were during a different question, that the others really didn't do anything for a long time. They seemed pretty happy with whatever was happening, or they were penned in effectively or something like that. But something appears to have changed since the Targaryen showed up. And a few things have happened. Obviously, the, the first night practice has been outlawed across Westeros, which created quite a lot of bastards which maybe quite a lot of them were given through the black gate to the others in a craster parallel. And they're not getting those anymore. That could be something. The fact that they are even using craster seems just so strange that there seems to be some sort of connection there. And also that the night's watch has dwindled by leaps and bounds since the uh, Targaryens took over and uh, the dragon, I think in particular with Alysanne, the dragon went over the wall. Well, it didn't go over the wall, but it went up to the top of it and then freaked out and came back down. Now we see that a lot of people have speculated, like maybe it was scared of the North. Maybe it was scared of the others. Maybe the wall made it do it. But I really enjoyed going the other way and thinking about what if the others 
somebody, one of them in their camouflage just looking up and saw a dragon go over the wall. It's like, well, that's terrifying to them too because they are weak to fire. And then if the, the lands of the long summer are coming to defeat them again, which seems like it happened before, then you can mm. see this as maybe defensive, but not justified, that kind of thing, where they're losing resources, they're seeing their enemies show up again, they're seeing the massing, gaining armies and land. It's like, yeah, I can, I can co you can start to s create a narrative where they decide their 10,000 year break is over. Yes, I, I like that. I particularly like the, the idea of the lands of the long summer, switching this around. George R. R. Martin repeatedly tells us that uh, no one is the villain of their own story. Right. Everyone is the hero of their own story. That, that doesn't mean that we need to look at the others and think that they're doing great things, but it does mean that there is a reason that they can justify to themselves what they're doing. I personally don't think that they are somebody's puppet, I think that they have been prompted into action by something. Um, as I say, I think this is, you yeah. know, perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll have, uh, have Matt back on and we'll discuss this in greater detail, but uh, in terms of what has prompted them to come back. Uh, but I think that they have been prompted to come back for a reason. And I think that um, although I like the idea of like the Targaryens being around or not, I, I can't, I, I don't think that the timing is exactly right there for me. I think it's something uh, more like 40-ish years ago is when they seem to be starting to move rather mm -hmm. than uh, when they would have first seen the dragons a couple of hundred years ago, perhaps sure. when, when uh, Je Je Harris and Alison were there. Um, so that doesn't quite work for me. I like the idea, but it doesn't quite work for me, I'm afraid. Um, I'm going to take a very quick pause just to say a couple of things coming up on my channel. Uh, I've already said that I am going to, I will bring to an end my series on Robert's Rebellion and the Tower of Joy. I've been promising it for so long. Apologies. Uh, I thought I was going to get at the, uh, the next one out this week, but I got slightly distracted by the teaser trailer. So I did a video on that one for teaser trailer for season eight, uh, but it's written, it's recorded. I just have to edit it now. So it will be up this weekend. That next one is uh, where well, it started out being uh, the quite simple question of whether Rhaegar and Lyanna married in the books as they clearly did on the show, but it's kind of branched out a little bit to try and answer the question of what on earth were they doing for all that time? Because this is like one of the unanswered questions really is that they disappeared and then like a year later Rhaegar appears again. Uh, but what were they doing apart from the obvious? <laughs> uh, must must have been something. So uh, so this is a the I've sort of delved into this idea of what on earth were they filling their time doing? All that why were they hiding away for so long? What was going on? Uh, so that's what the next one's going to be. Then I'm going to do one. I've come up with this amazing new theory, guys. You're going to love it. I'm going to call it R plus L equals J. It's going to blow your mind. No, uh, it's it's the world's oldest theory, R plus L equals J. But I couldn't do this whole series without covering it. I'm I believe it, uh, but I know that a lot of people have still got questions about it, uh, and I wanted to set out my thoughts on why I think it's true uh, just in one video, just so I can always refer people back to it. So that's going to come up. Then there's going to be uh, what I think happened at the Tower of Joy, um, and then finally, uh, well, two more after that. One of them is what on earth was going on with Aegon slash Phaegon. Uh, book people will know what I'm talking about there. And then finally, how Blood what Blood Raven's role was all in all of this. So, so that's the series of videos I'm going to be doing. They're definitely I'm definitely aiming to get them all done before season eight comes out. Um, and uh, the the next one will be this weekend. Uh, other stuff coming up. Um, uh, my second channel, I will say The Well Told Tale. If you don't know it, it's me reading audiobooks. I am going through what I consider to be the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. And it's just every week, uh, averaging about 45 minutes per week of me just reading great stories. We've done Frankenstein, we've done More of the Worlds, we did a Conan story. We're currently working our way through uh, the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. We've got a few, some HP Lovecraft coming up. We've got a lot of amazing stuff there. So if you're, if you're at all interested in that, please do go check out my second channel, 
the world told tale. And finally, I said every time, uh, patrons, thank you. I cannot do this without you. I honestly mean that I cannot do this without you. And I really appreciate it. If you would like to support this channel, if you'd like to get access to uh, some exclusive audio content, I do some exclusive stuff for my patrons. Um, uh, please do check out my Patreon page. There is a link down in the description. Uh, but Matt, what about you? What's coming? You, you're all over the place. You're, all, yeah. you're doing podcasting. You're doing uh, um, YouTube stuff. You're, you're watching the world. What's what's on your horizon? What's coming up for you? <sighs> well, the most recent thing I put out was. Oh, sorry. I hit my thing and everything started vibrating. Um, <laughs> for yeah. the teaser trailer, I did a stream with uh, Gray Area, uh, Sansa Snark from Watchers on the Wall, or Sam, San Rixian, Aziz actually showed up at the end, and Maddie K. Ray, who is a uh, excellent cosplayer and cool person. We talked about two hours about that, which seems a lot for an hour for, for a minute 45, but we definitely <laughs> went there. Um, coming up on Sunday, like we said earlier, we'll be on between two weirwoods talking about the mechanics of magic with LML and Crow Food's daughter. Um, on, then on Tuesday, this is a very busy week for me, I'll be on History of Westeros talking about the shivers and the other diseases that showed up in fire and blood I'm, and what I'm they mean. I'm going to be on that one as well, by the way. Are you? Oh. I am. Oh my God, Robert, we're seeing a lot of each other this week. We are, can't get enough. <laughs> carry, carry on. And um, I have a theory video I'm going to try and finish this weekend. It's... If you watched my Eamon, Maester Eamon, um, live stream with LML, History of Westeros, and Crowfoot Slaughter, you know what it is. It's a really cool one about uh, Targaryen's prophecy and the return of the dragons and kind of, a, it's a large meta look at it and how they all kind of fit together. That's written. Parts of it are recorded. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try and get it out this weekend to have it ready for next week. That one should be very good. I from from reviews I've gotten from people that have read it already. Excellent. Even if you do say so yourself. Well, uh, I, I usually think my stuff is garbage, but if other people <laughs> tell me it's good, then I go for that. If you, if you think it's good, then I'm sure it will be. Guys, I do highly recommend uh, you do go check out Joe Magician. Um, I'm sure my moderators will put a link down there in the chat if you're watching live. Uh, and incidentally, moderators, thank you so much. You're doing a fantastic job today. Uh, I, I've seen Chrissy Volstones and Jojo Dixon there as well. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate what you do. Um, guys, uh, we've got some more questions, actually. We're going to go slightly more random now. Um, probably mostly still links to the others and the children of the forest. Uh, but as you were talking about your video, your two hour long video about uh, <laughs> one and one and a half minutes worth of footage, um, uh, Wonder Dog 26 Art Girl says there's a great theory that Maddie said, uh, Maddie oh, was yeah. somebody who was on that uh, stream, uh, in which she shows the analogy of the chess and chess pieces that George uses. Do you want to... I don't know whether you remember that. Um, mm -hmm. I had a very quick look at it, so I knew, know what you're talking about. Do you want to quickly run over what that is? Yeah, I'll give you the 30 second version. You should definitely go check out her full um, explanation of it because it's really, really interesting. But basically, George is a massive chess nerd. He has written entire short stories just about chess and how it affected him because he was on the chess team in college. And he compares uh, Arya, John, and Sansa as they currently exist and how they're actually positioned in the tra in the teaser as different pieces on the board that John is the knight, that Arya is the rook, I believe, and that Sansa is the queen and how those interact and how even the way in chess strategy, how they're positioned and their interdynamics kind of actually are chess pieces. And it's really fascinating to think about. Um, yes. And I like that. I like the thinking. I have to say, I personally, I don't buy it. Um, oh. for a couple of reasons um firstly because i don't think that the trailer was anything to do with george R. R. martin how dare you um i th i think that that's <laughs> uh that's an hbo slash dan and dave thing um so i don't think that they will have uh picked up on anything that george R. R. martin's interested in outside of game of thrones secondly um the way that the three characters there if you're saying that um john is a knight, Sansa's a queen, and Arya's a rook. Then I may have gotten those, those wrong. No, well, I, those those were I think the the ones I, I had a very quick look on your video. I haven't seen oh, okay. the fuller explanation, uh, but those three 
um, pieces don't start next to each other and they certainly don't naturally sort of go next to each other. So it doesn't, for me, it doesn't kind of make sense that they're representative of that. Um, I like I like a lot of the thinking um, in terms of who is more like a queen character. And if you're a chess fan, then you'll probably get this. The queen is the most powerful piece on the board, can move around furthest, can fastest. Uh, everybody's scared of them. I think Daenerys works best with that, actually, I have to say, rather than Sansa, who's a lot more behind the scenes uh, and more sort of politicky. But um, I really like the thinking, but I have to admit, this is one of those ones that I personally don't agree with. Um, well, you also have to hash it out with Maddie. <laughs> well, I, happily. Um, uh, we had a couple of super chats. Maura Lee, thank you so much. This is your second super chat of the night. I very much appreciate it. $25. Uh, again, no question. You should drop some questions, Maura. Um, very happy to answer them. Um, and David Stave, uh, thank you. Uh, do you think a six skins sh uh, shadow cat or bear could uh, be wogged by Bran if the Night King has taken control of them? Um, so this is Varamir Sixkins, who mm -hmm. is a character in a one-off prologue uh, chapter um, that uh, he has, he's called Sixkins because he's got these different animals, six different animals that he can wag into. And the sort of the, the point of the, the chapter is him trying to work out can he extend his life by actually warging into a human um, and uh, basically failing miserably because he discovers actually, you know what, that this human has been turned into a white. Uh, so there's there's lots of layers to that chapter that deserves unpicking there. But is there anything you'd want to pick up on that in terms of um, uh, the, the question being, do, do you think that uh, the shadow cattle bear could be wogged into by Bran if, uh, if the Night King has taken control of them. Sure. Um, this is something that happens at the end of Night Flyers, um, the Whisper Jewel computer thing that the mother um, has control of. Uh, spoilers for Night Flyers. Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, Roy, De Roy De Aris and his mother fight over this thing and end up essentially having a mind wrestle where like sometimes one has control, sometimes the other has control. So it's definitely a George's wheelhouse to put in a situation where two psychic-like beings could fight over one body. Yeah, so I think this is true, and I think I, I agree that there has to be some kind of, and I think they'll struggle to show this on the show, but there has to be a, 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 an ex... I don't know what the right level is, ethereal plane struggle between Bran and the others, the Night King or Night, Night's King or whatever we have as a representation of the others in the books. There has to be some sort of struggle get there going on. And the, the way that has been sort of foreshadowed by George R. R. Martin in the books is fighting over a body mm. uh, in a way, uh, whether that's live or dead. So uh, thank you for that. I think that's a really interesting question. Um, we had uh, Nan three hundred four saying just wanted to say hi. Hi, good to see you. Um, oh, we yes. had one we missed, by the way. Um, uh, did we? Uh, beautiful okay, Dirt through. asked us to answer a question from. Ah, excellent. From uh, I got the. Wait, I'm trying to. Girl Nettle. She asked, "Why do the children need humans to sit in their trees? Humans have a drop of magical blood. Children are full blood and magical beings. What happened? I think. I think it's a decent question. What? Why are they having humans in control when it's their throne? Uh, so hang on, just trying to find the question. So it's why are the why do the children of the forest want the humans to be in control? Basically. Um, of, uh, well, I think it's simply a matter for me. Um, it, it, this is a matter of numbers. And I, it's, it's not a complicated question. One, I, I think this is a very simple one. The children of the forest do not reproduce quickly. They This has been their problem all the way through, uh, the, that they, they might live a long time, but there aren't many new ones. And so when they die off, the whole uh, um, the race dies off. So what we've faced with is now very, very few children of the forest still living. And if they're wanting to do anything, then they have to swallow their pride 
and use the other other people. I was going to say use the others who have powers. That's <laughs> a slightly different thing. Use other people Word who play. have got powers that they need in order to achieve the ends that they want to achieve. So that would be my take. Have you got any other takes on that one? I would say that um, it's emblematic of the creation of the others that the children were losing the war. That's why they recruited humans. So there's something that they see about humans that is maybe more vicious and maybe more warlike than they are on their own. Their tactics aren't work aren't working. So they were they introduced humans into their collective in order to kind of be the the sword for them the, or the person to swing the sword. Like like we, I talked about in the beginning, the Waymar versus the Bran. I mean, the Waymar versus Will, John and yeah. and Bran. One of them is watching and empowering. One's actually doing the fighting. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, and just to say, I, I love it, guys, when people do this. The the, the questions come through so quickly uh, on the chat at the, the moment that it's really hard to pick them out. So if somebody uh, puts a super chat up, then it comes up in color for us, we can actually see it. So we know we're not gonna miss it. And when people do that for other people's questions, I think that's amazing. So thank you so much. That was incredibly generous of you. And it was indeed a good question. Uh, and there was a follow-up question from Beautiful Dirt, five pounds. Thank you so much. Uh, can the children of the forest be trusted uh, given that they started this whole mess or were they just a bit naive? Your opinions, please. Well, I don't think they can be trusted. Um, uh, I, in, in as much as, that they and Bloodraven, the, the only thing in the books that we've seen directly from them is that they have taken uh, a young child and uh, dragged them all the way up north with, through huge amounts of danger um, uh, without advertising where this child was going to basically trying to turn him into some kind of tree wizard who's going to do their will. So that's, at the very least they are hiding their true motivations. Can they be trusted? Well, I don't think that they necessarily want humans to know everything, uh, but they will probably end up being on, or the way they end up seeing themselves as being on the same side as humans. Uh, and therefore it's more a matter of the enemy of my enemy is my friend than anything else. That's, that's my take on it. I don't think this is a goodies and baddies issue it's an issue of um no you can't trust them completely but some then external threat is threatening both uh what what do you think matt uh you took the the phrase right out of my mouth enemy and my enemy is my friend that seems to be the relationship and i would say the children are just more reckless the fact that they created a superpower in the others who controls winter and can raise the dead, but they also thought to put in a self-destruct button realizes means they knew what they were doing was dangerous. So they're perfectly willing to gamble the entire world against the invasion of the humans. And that's understandable when you're facing extinction, but also something that should make you question what they're still doing. Yeah, and building on this, one of my patrons' questions, Natalie Donald says, just wondering if you could discuss why readers generally view the children as a benevolent group, and what evidence there is that shows this may not be the case, if any. So just building on what uh, Matt was saying there a moment ago, um, there's lots of evidence that they are not, not particularly benevolent. The whole culture that they've got their form of magic it seems to be based upon blood sacrifice when um, they were doing these things are lost in legend obviously but when they were doing these magic uh, the huge mighty acts of magic way back when uh, the hammer of the waters and all the rest of it that apparently there were many 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 sacrifices uh, that, that happened at that time uh, and they um, clearly created, as we've said, the, the, the White Walkers, the others, in order to destroy humanity. So they're not goody-goody benevolent forces. Um, why do people think that they are? Perhaps that's because they've got the name children, uh, which makes them seem quite innocent. Perhaps because they're attached to nature, which we automatically think of as being quite a good thing. This is, I think, George R. R. Martin playing a little bit on the Tolkien way that and Tolkien, nature is good, uh, and the people trying to destroy nature are bad. I think that George R. R. Martin played on that a lot. So I think that he's trying to subvert this. Doesn't mean that they're all, they're entirely evil, as we've discussed, 
but it means that it's not the kind of the black and white world that we might first think of. Anything else to add on that one? Uh, yeah, I, th I think um, I think the primary reason people think of them as benevolent is because a lot of the POVs from the first few books that think about the children are followers of the old gods. So they, the, the characters we are seeing the world through revere them. It's hard for people to disconnect themselves from what they're reading. That happens quite a lot. Northerners and the Starks, especially Ned. Everyone loves Ned. How could Ned love something evil? That's kind of a... Um, kind of a thing that's hard to square in your head and also there's just the the story the one that brand tells when they're talking about the when the uh, last year went to go fight the others and then he says and then the children helped him and it's like okay so that's that's what george is telling you first then he's later deconstructing it but as any psychologist will tell you the first thing you hear is hard to dissuade people from yeah yeah absolutely um Let's take a, this is a show question really, about the Night King, uh, not your specialist subject, the show questions, Matt, but I, I <laughs> trust you're going to have a great one on this one. Uh, nobody is, this is Pegleg Peak saying, nobody has mentioned the Night King's ice weapons in any theory. Uh, this I think I assume is mainly main talking about the spear um, and uh, obviously the, the swords and things like that that they've been carrying around. I think those may, may be invaluable when it comes to killing him, your thoughts. So um, what, what do you think in terms of how do you kill the Night King and do you use his own weapons against him? Um, that's a tough one. I had, I had never really thought about this. Can you use ice to kill ice? Well, the wall holds him back in some way, although it's unclear if that's... A willing thing or not if it's if it's some the walls been forced on the others if they had a hand in creating it and they're abiding by something i would say that there's i don't even know how you would get one of their ice weapons lml has some ideas about the original ice being dawn and that mm. kind of that kind of thing um i, I think george has made it too obvious and he's just trying to he's just trying to simplify it that you kill them with the opposite of what they are you kill him with yeah. dragon glass, which is fire, frozen fire, or you kill him with swords, basically made from it. Yeah, and I one thing I would just add to that, in, in terms of the wall, the the physical ice wall is not the barrier. Right, right, right. The barrier is the magic that's being carved into its foundations. And when it was built, it wasn't this massively high thing. It was just like a normal wall. It's just that generation after generation, they kind of built it up and up and up. And so really it was never, in my mind at least, it was never meant to be this huge physical barrier that no one could possibly ever climb over this wall. It was the, the magical thing and it was more of a marker. We're, we're talking, I'm sure we will anyway, in, in when we're on Between Two Weirwoods with LML, um, about hinges in the world. And it's almost this idea of creating a magical marker, a magical border that some things cannot cross. So I think that's what's going on there. In terms of the whether the, the ice weapons will be used against them, no, I don't think that that's, the, that's where they're going. I don't think that they would um, uh, uh, be killed with their own weapons. I don't think that that's where, where we're at with this. I think I would agree it's sort of the opposites idea. Um, fire clearly does. I think that there's been a lot of discussion about when um, the Night King walked through fire, did that show that he was immune to dragon fire? No, I don't think it does because the dragon fire came down and then there was fire on the ground afterwards. That's not the dragon fire itself, so I don't think that means anything. Um, but for me, what I'd always come back to on this is that George R. R. Martin is a pacifist who is trying to show us the cost of war and the damage that this does across the piece. The solution to all of this is not going to be there's a huge battle and the big baddie is killed. That's not the, the end point to it. So what we're going to have is something that, yes, they may die, but the whole point is not that the, the solution to all of this is that the good guys kill the bad guys. And so I think that we need to kind of move our way away from this kind of thinking of how do we kill the Night King and more to a point of how do we 
remove the curse, identify what it is that they've been trying to get, uh, those kinds of thoughts. How do we make sure that there's a new piece? That's where we need to be going with it rather than how do we kill the big bad guy? Um, let's talk about uh, the children of the forest now. Uh, oh, actually, no, let's take one more about the um, the, the White Walkers. The um, uh, You'll like this one. What's at the heart of winter? Huh. Simple question. I do like this one. Oh, do you want to go first? Or you want me to take it? I would love you. So this is Jen Yu Yu, one of my patrons. So I'd love to hear your first. So the question is fully after that. What do you think is the heart of winter? Do you think it's an ice castle? Uh, do you think there could be anything else living up there? Maybe some undiscovered creatures. So what 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 do you think is there? Hang on a second. Let me crack some knuckles. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I think the heart of winter is, is I think it's a whisper jewel. The not exactly the same name, but the concept that George has used in the Thousand Worlds many times, where it's a a lump of rock or crystal of some sort that contains a soul. Basically, that's what it does. In both, he uses the the idea in fantasy as well as sci-fi. That that's not the important part. The important part is that George thinks that for some reason, weird crystalline structures enhances these kind of powers, especially the kind the others have. Because Nightflyers, the mother, is basically almost a one for to one for the others, especially in what she can do. So I think it's usually a way for somebody to cheat death. You pour yourself into it as you're dying, and then you live as sort of a bodiless consciousness reaching out from the um, the crystal or the rock or the item itself. It doesn't really matter what it is, but he likes crystals. So I think the heart of winter, we, I think it's what we saw in the show, where Night King had a huge lump of obsidian shoved into his chest. I think that's but that's basically what we're talking about, that obsidian in some way, maybe a large piece, maybe a small piece, but however the others were created, it probably has something to do with obsidian, and I would say that those two are linked. Um, yeah, I, I think I would agree. I think I always go to Fortress of Solitude. This is what I imagine when I think of it, is that, yes, lots of crystals. Um, to, to my mind, this uh, there may well be some kind of magic element to it, but what there definitely is, the heart of winter, we're not really told huge amounts about it. We just get this kind of flash, really, from uh, the vision that Bran has quite early on. Um, uh, and it's horrific, but I think the horrific thing is the the, the others rather than what's there. Um, and I think that this is effectively where they went. So we've got this big gap in the story, several thousand years. The, the others were there. They got defeated or pushed back or whatever, and then they disappeared from the world, and they were gone so far north that people thought they were legend. And that bit of so far north is named the heart of winter. I think if anything magic -y about it is some kind of connection with this, how they bring the winter. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that's the kind of the just simply because of the name. Um, uh, but uh, as a as a thing, it's where they went, where they hold up where they had their culture for whatever reason until they returned back down to the south. So that's what I I think is there. Um, ah, so you envision a castle, basically, or a, a village, kind of? Could be. I, I, I think George R. R. Martin is very vague about... I talk about the culture of the others quite a lot, and he's sort of said... You know, they're, they're another form of life that there's there's not a culture so much, but they clearly they've got, they've developed crafts and things like that. So he's uh, he's been very vague about what's going on there. I don't, whatever it is, is different to our understanding and of, of what civilization works like. And the best way that I understand it is by trying to think back at the, the kind of the classic stories of the fairy or the fae, mm -hmm. which is the kind of the image that is being presented here of these very beautiful but incredibly scary creatures that that's just suddenly very quietly appear um, and take away babies. That's very much the kind of the idea that's, that 
is trying to put into our minds. And they often live in this kind of other world that is that is almost beyond human imagining and that humans could go there, but things don't operate in the way that we would understand them to. So, um, uh, in, in fact, I'm sure I've read a book called something like Other World. Maybe it was Tad Williams that was based on that very thing, which um, suddenly I made, made a bizarre link there. Maybe, maybe, Sounds like um, Tad. Yeah, uh, and uh, George R. R. Martin clearly has read Tad Williams because there's a lot of mer memory, sorrow, and thorn uh, references going on in, in the song of Ice sure. Fire. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, that's that's by the by. But there are lots of books like that where the original fae or fairy it's a it's a different kind of civilization that's almost timeless um and that is what i imagine not a castle or a village but a different sure. different thing uh i would say uh, i talked in a lot of strange terms and fantasy terms I, I think the direct example in universe is take the undying of karth instead of a flaming heart it's an icy heart throw it north that's probably what they are basically like an ancient basically dead culture because they're all just thousands of year old beings that aren't doing anything anymore they're just surviving at this point i, I think that's the in the closest parallel we got i think that's why they're there yeah um i've just googled uh while you were talking i've just oh. googled it was other land by tad williams uh, and it wasn't exactly the one I was thinking of, but this is about sort of a virtual reality, a different kind of uh, of universe. Um, uh, and uh, there are clear links across two things like Lord of the Rings. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't think I was too far wrong on it, but uh, but um, uh, anyway, take that as you will. Um, one uh, question from uh, Time for a Kiss. Thank you so much uh, for the super chat. How flattered are British people that Americans are infatuated with British history, culture, and accents, i.e. Game of Thrones? Um, well, as the resident British person, uh, I don't think flattered is the right word. Um, uh, I think it's probably quite good for our economy, I'll tell you mm. that. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I think it's at the risk of going slightly deep on this i think it's a slightly double-edged thing is that yes i think it's 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 wonderful if other people are interested in your uh, your culture much of the world is is uh, fascinated and interested in american culture for example uh, but these kind of things are double-edged because you know a lot of the reason why a lot of the people are interested in british culture is because we went and conquered it and did bad things for a long time uh, so uh, i think there's two sides to this uh, uh, flattered is probably the wrong word um uh, but uh, i i i I love it. I think that there is a huge, rich seam uh, of history uh, and culture that is there and, and can be mined and, and has been mined by a lot of people. And I think that uh, George R. R. Martin um, uh, is probably, for me, he's, I mean, I'm not alone in thinking this, he is like the American Tolkien. So in the same way that Tolkien built his world as this, being this kind of, uh, he often talked about wanting to create uh, a a kind of a mythology for the English language. And I think George R. R. Martin is sort of creating that in a more American way. Um, uh, so there's there's kind of a, like a balance going on there. Um, uh, Matt, did you have any, any thoughts on any of that? Well, I would say that it's sort of almost like a lack of imagination on fantasy authors parts where i think a lot of them are like you were saying massive fans of tolkien massive fans of people uh, especially like uh, i would say hp lovecraft who's obsessed with english culture despite being an american and um other similar kinds of horror fantasy authors and they're just kind of rewriting what they read as kids and a lot of them aren't reaching for other things because that's not what they're enjoying a lot of them like even a song of ice and fire we love a song of ice and fire we both love this this is a great unique take on things but quite a lot of it is borrowed from other places it's kind of like a patchwork quilt of all of his favorite things all of his favorite authors his favorite worlds like especially ss ss is non-stop references to other things particularly Lovecraft, <laughs> quite a lot of Lovecraft and SS. So I, I, I think it is just these guys writing what they what they know and what they liked when they were growing up as well. It just seems to be perpetuating itself. I, I agree. And I think I, over over time, we, we've seen this, I think, in 
a lot of uh, popular culture in science fiction and fantasy is that we'll start seeing a lot more cultures starting being merged into that. So Firefly, this again, complete discretion, uh, digression, but uh, Firefly, I thought was wonderful with its uh, use of just use of random Chinese words um, uh, mm. that just thrown in there as a reflection of the fact that, hey, not everybody in the future will be speaking English. Um, uh, and perhaps they might actually be speaking the language that most people speak. Um, so that's the kind of thing. And I, I, I personally, I think that's great. I think that the idea that fantastical fiction has to be based on this idea of medieval England that is probably not 100% accurate in the first place is not even a little. quite outdated. <laughs> uh, there's a great amount of stuff you can get from that, but uh, the world of imagination has to be bigger. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, as I say, flat is the wrong word. I think it's great, but at the same time, uh, the whole point of about uh, fantastical literature is that it can draw from everywhere. Um, okay, so uh, we've got a couple more questions. Um, guys, I want to maybe about a quarter of an hour more, um, if that's all right. Uh, if you've got any more questions, now is the time to drop them in uh, the chat. Uh, we've got a couple more questions. Uh, one from John St. Baptiste. Uh, hi, John. I think I saw you in the chat earlier. It's good to see you again. Uh, do the children, the children of the forest, need the weirwoods? The weirwoods need the children, or is it a symbiotic relationship? Uh, so what, what do you make of that one, Matt? I would say, um, I, I would use a word that he didn't use, parasitic. I would say the children yeah. have turned the weirwoods into something they probably were not much in the same way they corrupted humans into others in order to serve themselves. That seems to be the way they go about their life. They, they find something, make it work for themselves, change it so it can't really go back. Like the others cannot go back to being humans. The weirwoods cannot go back to being whatever they were before. They are now irrevocably changed in order to serve the children. Yes, I would, I would agree. I think that, uh, what probably came first was the weirwoods in some way and then the children of the forest learned that they could in some way hook themselves up there they could use what was what was there they could in a way achieve immortality by putting themselves and their memories in through the weirwood network so um i'm, I'm not sure whether parasitic would be the word i would use here but i think that it, they are using them in some way um, and the Weirwood Network seems to have a different sort of consciousness and a different understanding of how the world works. We get Blood Raven gives that wonderful speech um, that if, if I had a memory for it, I would be able to recite <laughs> off the top of my head. But it's it's something about, you know, they do not experience time like we do. They, do, uh, they, they experience it through, um, uh, not, not through, changing of times, but sort of like seasons and, and things like this. And it's it's completely different approach to how they understand the passing of time. So actually it's not about uh, the children taking over and doing bad things. The, the trees probably don't really understand and care that much. I would probably. I, uh, argue. Um, so, um, Let's go to a question, the last question from my patrons, which was from Carrie Nevers. Um, this is about the others. Uh, and I name checked a little bit earlier the theory. Uh, I did a video on it, many other people have uh, sort of queried it as well, about this idea about whether the others or the White Walkers can cross running water. Hmm. Uh, and Carrie says, if the bridge crossings were destroyed, would the others be able to cross the waters of the Trident? Hence resulting in a showdown at the Trident as in Danny's visions. Um, so uh, as a first sort of bit of context to that, I certainly subscribe to this idea. It's come out quite a, a lot. Excuse me a moment. Glug, 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 glug. <laughs> it's come out uh, quite a lot on the show, I think, the idea that the White Walkers can't cross running water now we saw that very visually when the night king sort of goes to the water's edge and then john is just you know he's only 30 40 yards away from him in a boat and then the night king just stops and doesn't do anything um uh, oh we've only had a magic ice spear at the time i, I thought in, <laughs> uh, in retrospect but um uh, 
surely he could have gone there. They, the boats weren't moving very quickly, but they just let them go away. Then, then there was also a blink and you miss it moment in um, uh, the episode last season, uh, the Beyond the Wall, when you get just before uh, our heroes capture a white, you see uh, one of the white walkers walking with his um, uh, following whites go up to a stream, stare at it a moment, then turn and go off on a sort of perpendicular route, uh, which seemed to imply that he couldn't go across the stream. So that's the theory. It ties in with this curiosity that the wall stops bang on where the water starts rather than, you know, clearly anyone can get in a boat and go around it because they do. Um, but that's what seems to happen with the wall. Uh, surely that implies that there's something else that's stopping them going across the water. So that's the theory. I think it kind of makes sense to me because then if you look at where the um, the, the holy places for the children of the forest are the Isle of Faces, it would appear Dragonstone if there's a huge mine there for dragon glass, perhaps even Starfall if you're, if you're thinking that Dawn is very important in the, the end game. These are all islands and it would make sense that you put your holy places, places that the others can't or the White Walkers can't get to. Hmm. As I say, that's the kind of the theory. In terms of the practical question, and I'll come to you in a moment, Matt, on what you think on that. In terms of the practical question, if the bridge crossings were destroyed, would the others be able to cross the waters of the Trident? Um, this is another one of those times when I wish I was good at using clever computer things. I could pull up a map. Uh, but the Trident uh, is called the Trident because it's, it's formed from three different rivers. Um, uh, the green, the red, and the blue uh, tridents, and they, they, or they, uh, forks, sorry, which come into the, and form the trident. Now, the, the green fork is the one that heads all the way up north, and that's the one where you get the twins uh, controlling the crossing over that, and that sort of comes up, comes down from the neck. So, yes, uh, if you follow the theory that they couldn't cross that running water, then you the, you might say, fair enough, they have to stay on that one side. But an army could theoretically just go down the other side. It depends on whether or not they can get through the neck. That is the other big issue. And this is why the um, uh, the House Reed and the Cranach men are very important there because the neck is a natural pinch point. Uh, so it's whether, if you brought the winter with you, you would freeze the swampy mm. waters of the neck um, because they are not running waters, they are kind of swampy waters. Uh, so I think it's theoretically possible to go on either side of it. Uh, but Matt, what do you think of that idea from a book perspective, say, that they can't cross water? <sighs> that's, um, that's certainly a long running idea and fantasy to be sure vampires usually have that kind of stigma about them uh that's actually kind of the thing that popped up in lord of the rings with um the nazgul who try to i forget the name of the river but they try and cross it in order to get frodo and the wall of water and the horses come out and smash them that maybe there is some kind of power that the children have over rivers that we don't understand and maybe it's like a superstition that has kept going for them maybe there's nothing really there but they just know in the past, perhaps something like that happened, like the hammer of waters. Um, there's various ideas on what it is. It, it may have just been like an enormous tidal wave kind of thing the children caused. And if that's a thing they can do, I could see why you'd be afraid of that. I'm just looking at the map and looking from how you get from the wall to the trident without crossing a river. And that's very hard to do. <laughs> you would have to go over the mountains, through the wolf's wood, down through the Barrowlands, around Moat Kalen, and then it looks like maybe through the Vale in order to reach the Trident without crossing a river. <sighs> that that's a hell of a journey if that's what Martin has in has in uh, in mind for them. Well, uh, yeah, I'm now I'm now going to pull the map up, which is going to make for really bad um, uh, <laughs> watching. I have to say because I'm now going to have a look at map. Yes, there are there are there's a big um, the white knife. So yeah, the uh, can't see even see which river that one is, but there is a big river going in the uh, uh, yes, the last river. Um, mm -hmm. So it, if you were going to cross over that or avoid crossing over that, then you'd need to dip into the mountains. 
uh, but certainly you could attack the last hearth and the car hold before yeah. you got to that and then headed on down to Winterfell. Uh, so it's possible, um, but it's uh, where I come from in this is that otherwise it does the magical barrier carry on out into the sea. Is that what's mm. going on? And so when we're talking about, when I was talking earlier about the idea that the the barrier is not the actual wall itself, it's what was built into the foundations. If that was carried on through the sea, then um, actually it doesn't matter. Uh, but I like the <laughs> idea that they can't cross water um, uh, because of the fact that it echoes, as you say, so many of those things that we've got from other um uh sort of ancient fantasies like that we saw in dracula as well and 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 uh the idea of uh, a lot of the undead can't cross the water there's uh, a we, there's also the, the name of the weirwoods uh one one the word weir is a net going across a river so maybe george has something like that in mind some sort of mechanic he hasn't really gone into but he's hinting at it he does that quite a lot yeah yeah that's a that's a good point a um, couple of super chats. Uh, San Rixian, ten dollars. Thank you so much. Thank you for getting me through my long work day. You're very <laughs> welcome. Um, You're welcome, Mallory. <laughs> and uh, we've got uh, the internationalist, ten dollars again. Thank you. Uh, this is a question. I think I'll drop this one straight on to you, Matt, because I think this Ooh. follows up from where we were going. To start with talking about uh, the others wanting to find. Jon Snow and why might they want to find Jon Snow saying since the other strategy is to co-opt rather than to defeat they take on board whoever they they kill they co-opt into sure. their own side do they want Jon as a potential leader um uh, the clue being the come at me bro scene in hard home instead <laughs> uh, being instead the see the power you will have um so this is obviously slightly different because the hard home uh, plays out differently in the books. John's not gone up there, so we don't have the big fights. But on the show, then there's the the you know the staring competition between the Night King and John, and and it's very much a uh, yeah, see the power I've got. So what what do you think? Are are they trying to recruit John to be a powerful member of them, as it were? I would say yes, in some sense. The Waymar and like a, and Benjen were fail states. They killed them when they didn't, when they weren't who they were looking for, and the others, as a species, basically are mine invaders. The whites themselves, they pick up the undead and make them move around like puppets. What they do to the Craster's children, this is not for certain, but based on the evidence, I think it's very clear that what they're doing is they are choosing children much in the way that Bran can use Hodor because he his mind isn't very developed. They go in and take the body from the child and then inhabit it. That they're they're kind of disembodied ice demons at this point. Their real bodies are long dead, basically. So it may be that the Night King, the Great Other, whatever is actually in that Whisper Jewel, it, it may be they need a particular magical lineage or or they think they do much in the way that melisandre thinks there's powers in king's blood maybe there's some sort of superstition like that going on but they want john in particular and probably to take over his body probably not to install him as their leader like i, I don't think it's like i don't know if you ever play world of warcraft i don't think it's like an arthas bolvar fuller dragon sylvanas kind of thing i think it's more along the lines of they want what he has and they're going to steal it because that seems to be the way of, in many, many of George's works, the idea of stealing a body, a power from somebody else that has it. Yes. And, well, I, I think that works with the original idea that the uh, if we're taking the show's version of events, and I think the book's going to be very similar, uh, that the creation of the original White Walker, uh, they effectively stole or perverted the uh the um the old magic that was that that person had and turned it into a different kind of magic so that the, the power to wag into living humans or living creatures was turned into a power to, to control dead creatures and dead humans and, and so on so it's a kind of a, a flip side of that a um, couple more super chats. Thank you so much, guys. This has been uh, really generous. Uh, Marvin Martin uh, saying, 
Is producing fertile offspring with man proof that the children of the forest are closely related to humans? Um, yeah, possibly, yes. Um, I, th I think that there are a lot of creatures there. Again, we were talking about this on me earlier with the, the giants as well, that there are rumours that there are people descended from giants. Um, I, I think, I, as my take I mentioned earlier again, that I think we can look too much into the science of it to try and figure out stuff. And this is magical. And I think that if we can have two creatures, it's quite a, a fantasy trope in a way that you have uh, half elves or, or, or half orcs or whatever. And I think that this is going on that idea. Let's, let's f try and forget about the closeness of the gene pools or whatever, like the science behind all of this. Let's just try and say, this can happen. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, go ahead. I would say um, I, whenever there's questions like this, like how could it work, the genetics, like people try doing Punnett squares and like Mendelian genetics in order to figure stuff out. I always look back to George's explanation of his dragons. He's like, look, they're realistic. They don't have four legs. They have two legs and then wings. I'm like, they're dragons, George. There's no such thing yeah. as realistic. You're making it up. It's fine. It's fantasy. Cool. I'm I'm happy to <laughs> I'm happy to go along with his imagination. I don't need it to make sense on a grounded scientific level. Uh, agreed, and I'm quite I'm quite happy to go with that. That looks cool basis. Uh, but uh, as we're on the science, um, Tina Huff saying being dead without oxygen or gases in the body, so no buoyancy. I think that's why they can't swim. What do you think? Um, uh, you ever see so, Pirates of the Caribbean? Come on. <laughs> I, I think that what I would say on this one is we have to try and delineate between the, uh, and I'm going on uh, show logic here rather than book logic, so that may be completely different logic, but show logic, there's a, clearly a difference between the White Walkers and the Whites, the, the humans that they've reanimated. Uh, the Whites seem to be able to go underwater. Somebody attached those cables to a, a dead dragon at the bottom of a lake. Mm. Um, uh, and we clearly saw some of them um, coming up after John out of the water. So uh, so they seem to be able to, to do that. Um, the White Walkers seem perhaps not to be able to do that. So um, in... The books, George R. Martin has been very clear that the others are not just dead or undead. They are a different kind of life. So all our understandings of, of how they operate, I think we have to set them to one side and say, OK, so they don't work in the way that we do. The, 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 the respiratory system is different and all the rest of it. So let's, uh, my take is that, yes, although I think that's a very logical answer for why perhaps they can't uh, cross water or, or swim, I think it's a, let's just take George R. R. Martin at his word that this is different, this is magic. Mm. Um, guys, I'm gonna start wrapping up there. So um, uh, I, when I do this, Everybody always piles in a whole <laughs> load of questions. Questions, um, questions, questions. <laughs> uh, but but I do want to sort of uh, end up quite soon. Um, were there any questions, Matt, that you've spotted that you think it'd be really good for us to be doing just to end on? Um, there were. There is actually a comment right here that I really liked from Ponderous Reader. He brings up with the water, Mother Roin, that there are water wizards. So, okay, I can accept that. That could be a reason they're afraid of it. There's some. There's a magic in water, much in the way they use ice, which is just frozen water. So, okay, that's fine with me. Um, there's a question here from, like, I'm gonna have trouble pronouncing this. Putin, Putan Eska. Uh, he was actually asking LML, but I liked the question anyway. Instead <laughs> of a great other, could the others be like the stone men, a kind of fallout from the magical environment damage the singers caused in the north? kind of i mean nuclear fallout's a thing maybe the hammer of waters warped people around them i mean it's not the craziest idea yeah um there is uh beautiful dirt five pounds thank you so much uh just random love for the end everyone hit the like button 
Robert, please say nomenclature for LML. <laughs> well, there you go. I, I, I mean, I, was he asking for that? Or was he just thinking he needs to hear the word? Um, hashtag hold me close, hashtag tiny dancer. Uh, <laughs> I, I read that first as tiny Sansa, but you know, that's probably says more about where my mind goes. Um, <laughs> uh okay guys um i think i'm going to wrap up there uh matt do you want to just remind everyone where they can find you on the internet you know i really need to get like a recording of this so i can just hold it up to a mic just so there's so <laughs> many things make it fresh uh, I mean, each time well it's not always that fresh every time well it's just titles and titles robert they just keep going. Uh, first place you can find me is on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Joe Magician. Uh, you can all, there, I also have a Patreon, patreon.com slash Joe Magician. And on Twitter, Joe Magician 42. A lot of Joe Magician going on here. On um, Watchers on the Wall, where I'm a feature writer. Um, I'll be showing up on History of Westeros, Between Two Weirwoods, and the Night's Cast, the Watchers on the Wall podcast coming up as well on the A Song of Ice and Fire subreddit, where I'm a moderator and Maester Monthly, where, of course, there will be another podcast coming out soon. This is this is the month of that, apparently. Um, let's see here. Am I forgetting any others? This is always the problem. There's just too many. Um, oh, and the video coming out soon about Danny on the Pyre and Dragon Dreams. That will be pretty awesome. Uh, bookshelf, stu bookshelf Stud will be on the video. Rumors are that Bookshelf and poor Quentin or Emmett Booth will be on the live stream for that, talking about all the crazy Eldritch stuff I'm, that's in that. I think that's all. I think I got it. Excellent. And as a reward for that, you can answer a question that uh, I think is quite a tough one, but I'm sure you're going to have the answer. Mazamonti, thank you for this question. Where are the male children? Where are the male children? Um... Good question. I think in I think in the world of ice and fire, I think it, I think this is correct. There are pictures of male children. Um, I believe that the green seers are supposed to be male. I'm not sure about that one. Um, I don't know. Maybe they maybe they all died, or maybe they all went into the others because the others are all male themselves, except for one, one particular other. Well, quite possibly, and I. I would also just say that the we don't know in the books because we've not really seen much by way of the children in the forest maybe they're on the isle of faces um, sure. green uh, men the green men uh maybe they do rely on other races um where humans come from um we don't know the short answer is and 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 i think this is one of the things that i I hope I bring to this community is it a willingness to say I don't know and and I try to restrict that to times when I think that we don't know because George simply hasn't told us and and I think that that is the situation here is that uh, we haven't got enough information yet to come to a full answer to that and so sorry we don't have a, a <laughs> Uh, guys, uh, thank you very much. Um, all I would say uh, from my side is uh, once more, patrons, thank you. I really appreciate your support. Um, it does keep me going. And uh, if you are at all interested in becoming a patron, please do check out my Patreon page. There's a link down in the description. It's the best way to help support this channel. And there are some patron only benefits over there as well. Guys, thank you so much. Particular thanks for the super chats. Thank you, Matt. Uh, please do go and check out Joe Magician, uh, a fantastic channel uh, with some really excellent videos up there. And you've heard him reel off all the other places you can find him too. Uh, guys, we'll be back next week. Um, I've got some really good guests lined up uh, that I'm not going to tease yet because I haven't got the dates sorted with them, but some people I'm really excited to have on, some new people for the channel and some people I know that you've uh, you've been asked to have back on. But thank you so much. We'll be here same time next week with another live stream. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you, guys.